Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My subject tonight is star birth and star death, the crucible of life. That is, I will be talking about the physical side of life, the universe, and everything. More specifically, I will try to relate these ideas to the broad sweep of modern cosmology, and in particular, I'll talk about what all this has to do with the birth and death of the planet we live on. By now, I'm sure you're all quite sick of hearing about 100 years since Albert Einstein burst on the scene. It's rather difficult in this day and age to realise just how stunning some of those papers of 1905 were. The three big ones were the papers, of course, on special relativity, the papers on the photoelectric effect, which laid the foundations for quantum physics, and the paper on Brownian motion, which most people haven't heard about anywhere near as much, but is the one that finally led us to be able to precisely measure the size of atoms. These papers completely challenged mankind's perception of reality, and these articles also laid the foundation for most of 20th century physics. Now, from the perspective of someone who's not a specialist in physics, these articles are still of tremendous historic and social interest because they also laid the foundations for a good swathe of 20th century technology. And technology, as opposed to fundamental physics, is often more immediate impact for the proverbial man in the street. But I emphasise that modern technology simply cannot be successfully developed without a firm basis in fundamental science, which is one reason why some fraction of the scientific community, some, not all of us, works on the so-called deep issues. Things like, what does it all mean? Where did the universe come from? And where is it going? 2005 also marks 90 years since the publication of Einstein's general theory of relativity. The general relativity of 1915, as opposed to the special relativity of 1905, is Einstein's theory of gravity. This general relativity is the theory that leads physicists, astronomers, and mathematicians to talk about such notions as black holes and the Big Bang the foundation stone of modern cosmology. And if you're willing to indulge in a little speculation, it's Einstein's general relativity that leads to such outre ideas as wormholes in space-time and even time travel. But let us leave the speculation to the science fiction community and to Hollyweird. Today, I will talk about things that are definitely mainstream, things that have a tremendous amount of backing in the form of direct empirical data and observation. So forget the speculation for now. By the late 1700s, it was already clear that the stars, whatever their source of energy was, had limited lifetimes. Eventually, they would burn out and go dark. So even then, over 200 years ago, there was serious discussion of how stars and their accompanying stellar systems, that is, their planets, asteroids and comets, might form, grow, age and die. Much of the detail of this discussion from 200 years ago is now somewhat irrelevant. At the time, 200 years ago, physicists had no concept of atomic or nuclear structure, and so estimates of the energy budget for a star's lifetime are to modern ears ludicrously off base. People were thinking a few million years and that's it. Sorry, a few million is much, much shorter than what we now know as the correct figure, which is a few thousand million. It was only with the revolution of physics in the 20th century, a revolution largely but not entirely due to Albert Einstein, that physicists and astronomers were able to put together an accurate model of how the stars are put together, accurate models of how the stars shine, and accurate estimates for their total lifetimes. These days, when your child wanders up to you and asks, quote, dear parental unit, why does the sun shine? 
We actually do know the answer. The sun shines thanks to the thermonuclear burning of hydrogen to helium deep in the sun's core. This thermonuclear burning, and there's no oxygen required, it's not a chemical process, heats the core to several millions of degrees Celsius so that it glows white hot with thermonuclear fire. And I should point out at this stage that the person responsible for developing most of this theory, Hans Bethe, uh, died just last week. He had a very long life and a very long career and was doing work well into his early, late 80s and early 90s. Now, to get back to the main theme of my talk, the general framework in which present-day physicists and astronomers work when dealing with questions of the origins and ultimate face of the universe is that of Big Bang cosmology. Cosmology is the study of the universe as a whole, and before Einstein developed his general relativity, cosmology was more of a part of philosophy and religion than it was a part of science. The theory of general relativity changed all that. Once you have general relativity, you can begin to formulate cosmological questions in a precise mathematical framework that is both logically consistent and subject to empirical testing. And that major change of the last hundred years is what has taken cosmology and turned it from an aspect of philosophy into an aspect of modern science. Now, what is general relativity? Stripped to its essentials, General relativity is the dynamics of geometry, a phrase that would make a classical mathematician cringe. Sometimes it's called geometrodynamics. If I slightly modify the words of John Archibald Wheeler, quote, the geometry of space and time tells matter how to move, and the presence of matter tells space and time how to warp and twist, unquote. This arena, space and time jammed together, in which terms of which we formulate general relativity, is lumped together by the mathematicians and physicists into a unified whole. We call it space-time. So every time you hear us talking about space-time, it's just lump it all together, space-time, we treat them largely on an equal footing. Not identically equal, but very similar. The key mystery of Einstein's general relativity is this. The geometry of the universe is not that of Euclid. In fact, Euclidean geometry and the famous five axioms of Euclid that hopefully you've all learned in high school are only an approximation to the way the universe really works. Euclid's geometry works perfectly well in flat space. But the presence of matter warps both space and time so that it is no longer flat. In reasonably small chunks of space-time, Euclidean geometry is a truly excellent approximation. Inside this room, Euclidean geometry is fine. If you try to look too closely at an extremely small hunk of space-time, you do expect quantum weirdness to come into play. But we only expect quantum weirdness to affect space-time once you are at extremely small distances, about a million, million, million times smaller than the nucleus of an atom. And this is well beyond present-day experimental and observational probes. On the other hand, at large distances, we do begin to see deviations from Euclid's geometry. These deviations are well within our ability to test experimentally and observationally. For instance, these deviations from Euclid's geometry already show up in the global positioning system. The designers of the GPS system, though thankfully not the users, did have to take general relativity into account when setting the system up. Further out in our solar system, 
Effects such as the bending of starlight by the sun, the slowing of clocks deep in a gravitational field, and the time delay that radio signals suffer when crossing a gravitational field are all aspects of subtle non-Euclidean effects in our planetary neighbourhood. And these are all features of general relativity that we can and do test on a regular basis with astronomical observations, both with visible light and with radio telescopes. However, it's once we move beyond our own solar system and even beyond our own galaxy, the Milky Way, that things get really interesting. As we look further out into the cosmos, we see something that at first stunned the astronomers of the 1930s. Other galaxies are moving away from us. And the further out we look, the faster they are moving. This is the Hubble flow, the recession of the galaxies. And if we naively just run this Hubble flow backwards, we project it backwards in time, we find that the galaxies must have been sitting on top of each other about 10,000 million years ago. This ultimately is the observational foundation underlying Big Bang cosmology. And when you get a little bit fancier and don't just run the movie backwards, but you actually try to solve the Einstein equations of general relativity instead of making an eyeball estimate based on the present Hubble flow, the age of the universe comes out as approximately 14,000 million years. So speaking broadly and in round numbers, the history of our universe goes like this. Some 14,000 million years ago, give or take the odd thousand million years, the universe was in an extremely hot, extremely dense phase of matter. This extremely hot, extremely dense fireball was expanding and the expansion continues to this very day. The original fireball at that stage was too hot and dense for objects like stars and planets to exist. It was even too hot and dense for things like individual atoms to exist. Or it was even too hot for the nuclei of individual atoms to exist. At that stage, it was a soup of elementary particles called a quark-gluon plasma. As the universe expands, the temperature drops. The quarks first condense to form protons and neutrons, and this is called the quark confinement phase transition. Later on, some fraction of the protons and neutrons burn via thermonuclear fusion to form helium. This is the epoch of cosmological helium production, which took place long before the stars were formed, but still accounts for the majority of helium you see in the universe to the present day. After cosmological helium production, the fireball consisted of a plasma of protons, helium nuclei, electrons, and photons, with a few relic neutrinos and gravitons thrown in for good measure. The heavier nuclei, such as carbon and oxygen, had not yet had a chance to form. Because the fireball was still a plasma, it conducted electricity. And because light is ultimately electromagnetic radiation, the plasma was opaque. Like metal is opaque. Metal is opaque because if you shine light on it, the electric fields in the light get shorted out by the conducting metal. It stops. In more picturesque language, the photons, the quanta of light, were being scattered back and forth all over the place. And if you were magically transported back to that time, you would not be able to see through the dense glowing muck you would also be very quickly crisped to a cinder, but that's another story. As the universe continues to expand, the temperature drops. Eventually, the electrons start to pair up with the protons and with the helium nuclei to form hydrogen atoms and helium atoms. 
This is the epoch traditionally referred to as recombination. Though nothing has actually been recombined, it should really be called first combination or even first atom formation. Once this recombination occurs, the plasma pretty much goes away, and soon you have neutral hydrogen and neutral helium, and the plasma has been converted to neutral, non-conducting atoms. Once that happens, once the atoms are non-conducting, you've got hydrogen and helium gas, which are transparent. So from that point on, the photons are now essentially free to fly all the way across the universe. The photons have now largely decoupled from the matter of the universe, and they're free to go, and we still see these photons. Astronomers and physicists regularly, reliably, and consistently detect photons from this epoch of decoupling in their experiments. These primordial photons which have been freely streaming through the universe since the fireball became transparent, are known as the cosmic microwave background or the cosmic background radiation. At decoupling, once the photons started to fly freely through the universe, the cosmic fireball was still very hot, about 3,000 Celsius, much hotter than you'll get in your oven. At 3,000 Celsius, the photons had a characteristic distribution of energies related to this temperature. Of course, when we look up at the sky right now, we do not measure a temperature of 3,000 degrees Celsius. When you look for the cosmic microwave background, you instead measure a temperature of 2.7 degrees above absolute zero, which translates on the Celsius scale to about minus 270 degrees Celsius. Seriously cold. The reason that the temperature has changed between decoupling and the present epoch is that as the universe expands, so does the wavelength of the light. In fact, the wavelength of the light and the size of the universe grow in lockstep. Since the physical speed of light is constant, the frequency of the light, that is the number of beats per second in the electric field, decreases as the universe expands. So light that at decoupling was concentrated in the extreme ultraviolet, and we're talking serious sunburn territory here, first becomes blue, then green, red, infrared, until now it's been red shifted all the way down into the microwave radio band, which is how it was discovered by Penzias and Wilson when they were trying to get nice, clean reception on their um, microwave radio systems, and they couldn't. There was an unavoidable hiss that they got no matter where they pointed their antennas on the sky. And so it was a purely technological effort to try and build a good communication system that, in some sense, accidentally wound up discovering the cosmic microwave background. Now, between decoupling, when the universe becomes transparent, and the present day, the wavelength of these primordial photons has been stretched by a factor of about 1,000. This means the frequency has been reduced by a factor of about 1,000, and the temperature of the light has been reduced by a factor of about 1,000, provided you measure from the absolute zero of temperature. So something that in physicist language is about 3,000 Kelvin gets shifted down to something that is about 3 Kelvin. During this time, the size of the universe has expanded by about a factor of 1,000 in all three directions, which means that the volume of the universe has changed by a factor of about 1,000 million. After decoupling, the temperature of the fireball continues to drop. It's still a relatively long time until the very first stars begin to form. The temperature has to drop to about 30 Celsius, 
remarkably close to room temperature, before baby stars have even a chance of getting past the first hurdle. But what is a baby star? Stripped to its essentials, the fireball contains small fluctuations in density. Places where the fireball is a little more dense than average and places where the fireball is a little less concentrated than average. The regions that are a little bit more concentrated than average attract yet more matter to themselves gravitationally. The regions that have a little less matter than average have the remaining matter sucked out of them by the gravity in the over-endowed regions. The result is positively biblical. To him that hath, more shall be given. And he that hath not, from him shall be taken even what little he hath. <laughs> this process, building up over the eons, leads to the formation of stars, planets, and even the galaxies themselves. The very early stages of this process, the irregularities that exist at the time of decoupling when the plasma becomes transparent, leave a measurable imprint on the cosmic background radiation. The temperature of this radiation is not exactly 2.7 Kelvin in all directions. There are small fluctuations, about one part in a million, scattered over the sky. The detectors of the physicists and astronomers are now good enough to measure such tiny temperature differences. And what that does is it provides a sky map of temperature fluctuations measured now, which corresponds to a sky map of temperature fluctuations at decoupling, which translates to a sky map of density fluctuations at decoupling. And so finally, it gives you a map that tells you what part of the sky had a little bit more matter than average and which parts of the sky had a little bit less matter than average, at least at the epoch of decoupling, about 13,000 million years ago. Quite a while. These tiny variations at decoupling, which I emphasize we can observe directly in the cosmic microwave background, these are the seeds that grow up to be the stars and galaxies. And after a bit of recycling, these are the seeds that grow up to be planets, including our own. But in our discussion, we're nowhere yet near to forming planets. we would just gotten to the first stars forming when the temperature of the fireball dropped to about 30 Celsius, which is about 300 Kelvin, and that's about 12,000 million years ago. These very first stars consisted of hydrogen and helium and nothing else. The heavier elements, like carbon and oxygen, had not yet had a chance to form. It's only as the first generation of stars ages and begins to die that the first heavy elements are formed by thermonuclear fusion. And I emphasize that to an astronomer Anything heavier than the very lightest elements, hydrogen and helium, is a heavy element. In fact, half the time when an astronomer talks about a metal, they mean anything heavier than helium. As the first generation of stars ages, their cores first burn hydrogen to helium, then helium to carbon, then to oxygen and yet heavier nuclei, and eventually they move all the way down the curve of binding energy to reach iron-56. Now, iron-56 is a particular isotope of iron that is the most tightly bound of all the nuclei with the least amount of free energy. It's the end point of the thermonuclear fusion process. You can't get any more energy out of the nucleoid by going past iron-56. Iron-56, in fact, is completely stable against nuclear decay. Now, some of those first-generation stars will just burn out and fade away. But some will tap into their gravitational potential energy, letting the central core shrink 
while the outer layers expand. Some of these first generation stars will shed their outer layers in a relatively gentle manner and quietly burn out into a cinder. But some of them, and specifically in the case of first generation stars, perhaps the majority, will undergo violent supernova explosions as their cores radically destabilize gravitationally. Now, supernova explosions do two marvelous things. First, they spread the guts of burnt out stars all over creation. And second, they convert some of that gravitational potential energy to heat and light. And what that does is it pushes some of the nuclei up the other side of the curve of binding energy until you get to really heavy things like uranium, thorium, and lead. Creating uranium and thorium and lead from iron is energetically unfavorable. Heavier elements like to fall down to the iron 56. Light elements try to clump up to iron 56. Iron 56 is the most stable. But if I've got an outside energy source, like the gravitational energy in the collapsing core of a supernova, some of that energy can be pumped into the nuclei to give you not thermonuclear fission, but inverse fission that actually builds up heavy elements all the way up to uranium. And so at this stage, when the first generation of stars have blown up in supernova explosions, you now finally have some amount of heavy elements to start to build planets. So when the second generation of stars begins to form, we have a much more interesting mix of elements to work with. Hydrogen and helium still predominate, but at least we have a few percent of heavier elements to play with. This does at least two things. It modifies the internal dynamics of the second generation stars. It also provides material for rocky planets and asteroids to start to form. By now, as well, the galaxies are starting to form, partly because the first generation of stars, as far as we can tell, well, they were not clumped into galaxies, but when they went off in supernovas, those shock waves from the supernova explosions that spread the heavy elements around also helped to collapse the lumpy dust clouds leading to the birth of second generation stars which then typically were clumped into galaxies. Now, all of this is still going on about 11,000 million years ago. The first generation stars were typically much larger than most of the stars we see near us today, and they burned very bright and died very quickly, burning out in only 1,000 million years or so, very short for the typical life scale of a modern star. Second-generation stars were, by and large, more sedate. And on average, they lived about 6,000 million years, partly because the second-generation stars were typically smaller and partly because the heavy elements produced in the first generation acted as a moderator, slowing down the headlong rush to burnout. But when the second generation does burn out, Again, some fraction undergo supernova explosions, spreading yet more heavy elements around the universe in preparation for the third generation. Now, as with human genealogy, this talk of generations is to some extent convention. There are certainly stars born and dying continuously between the generations, just like human populations. Nevertheless, it's a useful convention, and typically we assign our own sun to the third generation. In the case of our own sun, planet, and solar system, because we're on the spot, we have many much more direct ways of measuring age, and so we can pin down the birth of our sun much more precisely. The birth of our sun and the condensation of planet Earth out of the nebula dust was about four and a half thousand million years ago, 
And now we can be pretty confident we've got the timing down to within 100 million years. 100 million years at least is a lot better than 1,000 million years. <laughs> but note that we've had to go up to three generations of star formation to even get to the formation of our own planet. Also note that all of the heavy nuclei we see around us, the carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, the silicon, the rocks and metals, everything you can whack down here, this all came, these were all born in stars that have undergone supernova explosions so that they were able to spread those nuclei around to then come around and clump and form our planet. The only material in our immediate vicinity that we can trace back essentially unaltered to the quark gluon phase transition is the hydrogen in the water and the organic materials here on Earth. Those protons go all the way back to the quark gluon phase transition. Everything else came along later. Even the helium, and there's not that much of it here on Earth, but even the helium at most dates back to cosmological helium burning episode. And a good hunk of the helium is much younger than that. It comes from other stars. But everything else comes from the old core of a burnt out star that then underwent a supernova explosion. In a very real sense, we are all recycled star stuff and the stars are the crucible of life in at least two senses. Our sun provides the heat and light on which our biosphere runs, and previous generations of stars provide the raw material that makes up the planet. Though our sun has a finite lifetime, our best estimates are that it's still got about 2,000 million years left before it burns out. So we shouldn't feel any immediate concerns in this regard. There's plenty of other problems that can knock our civilization for a six on a much shorter time scale. In the long run, though, our sun will die. In the process, destroying our planet. Near the end of its lifetime, the sun will swell to a red giant phase, engulfing and melting the Earth and indeed all of the inner planets before finally recontracting to a cold, burnt-out cinder. And in fact, our sun is a bit too small for it to undergo a supernova explosion. It might go through a few nova phases, but it's certainly never going to go supernova. It's just a little bit too light. Now, there will certainly be a fourth generation of stars. In fact, in our telescopes, we can see star birth going on right now. There are dust clouds in the Eagle Nebula just starting to shine with inner thermonuclear light as the dust collapses, condenses and heats up due to compression. This is just like a bicycle pump which heats up after you pump vigorously and compress the air a little bit. The same process happens in dust clouds out in space. Once they start to collapse, they compress, they get hot. Once they get hot enough, up to a million degrees Celsius, thermonuclear reactions start. And then the star begins to shine with its own nuclear light. This final ignition phase takes a very short time, maybe as little as 100 years between the final collapse and before a full-fledged star emerges. The formation of planetary systems seems to take somewhat longer, but is still amazingly short by geological standards. The evidence from meteorites we've collected in our own solar system is that the actual planetary formation phase might take as little as 100,000 years, which is an eye blink compared to the 4,500 million years our sun has so far been shining, or the 14 odd thousand million years the universe has existed. Still, not only will our solar system eventually die, but all stars and their planetary systems will eventually die. Even if there are several more generations of stars to be expected in our universe, each generation of stars eats up more of the hydrogen and eventually further star formation will cease. 
The universe itself will die. A picture poetically referred to as the heat death, or more accurately, the entropy death. As long as there are temperature differences in the universe, or more technically, entropy gradients, then life, though possibly not life as we know it, can survive by feeding off the entropy gradient. Let me give a couple of examples. In a sense, this is what the entire biosphere of Earth currently does. It imports lots of high-quality, low-entropy sunlight in the visible part of the spectrum. And it exports a lot of low-quality, high-entropy waste in the form of heat and infrared radiation back out into the night sky. Now, energy is conserved. The total energy that comes in from the sun equals the total energy radiated out from the Earth. But the key point is that there is a temperature difference between the energy coming in. It comes in at the temperature of the sunlight, about 10,000 Celsius, and the temperature that you're radiating it out at, which is somewhere near the freezing point, and the point is you're radiating it into the night sky, which is at a temperature only of 3 degrees Kelvin, that is about minus 270 Celsius. Remember that cosmic background radiation I was talking about before. So it's this temperature difference between the energy in and energy out that is what finally drives life here on Earth. The same basic physics affects each one of us directly and personally. You, as an individual human being, survive by importing high-quality, low-entropy material into your body. It's called food. You also, on average, export an equal mass of low-quality, high-entropy material back into the environment. And I trust I do not have to go into explicit detail about that. <laughs> as long as you export more entropy than you import, your body can use that entropy difference to do interesting things. That's called being alive. In the absence of an entropy difference between imported and exported material, you will die. Applied to the entire universe, once the temperature differences in the universe are all smoothed out, once entropy differences shrink to zero, the entire universe will die. And this is what is referred to as the heat death or the entropy death. Still, this should not become a pressing problem for at least another 100,000 million years or so. So it's hard to get too excited about it. There are many more immediate concerns we can and should worry about. One obvious candidate is asteroid impact or cometary impact. We know that large asteroids and comets periodically hit the Earth, and we have good reason to believe that these impacts have something to do with major extinction events in Earth's biosphere. Certainly something big hit the Earth 67 million years ago, suspiciously close to when the dinosaurs died out. And it wasn't just the dinosaurs that died out. Every land-dwelling animal heavier than about 20 kilograms seems to have snuffed it as a species. Several other impacts have occurred suspiciously close to other extinction events. Of course, I'm talking millions of years here, and numbers like that tend to make people switch off a little because I think it's maybe not that important. But try this one on for size. 11 years ago, just 11 years ago, the comet Shoemaker-Levy collided with the planet Jupiter. Now, we're not just talking a little gentle meteorite shower. We're talking about enormous, great, continent-wrecking slabs of methane ice screaming out of the sky at 30 kilometres per second with impacts that release energy in the 100 gigaton range, which is significantly more than the combined energy of every nuclear weapon ever constructed by mankind. Now... The fact that in the relatively short time that we've been able to make detailed surveys of the rest of our solar system, 
We've already seen one such planet-wrecking impact should, I think, at least make you stop and think a little bit. If there was any life down in Jupiter's atmosphere 11 years ago, then the arrival of Shoemaker-Levy definitely qualifies as a major extinction event. In the short run, we definitely need to get our own house in order. But in doing so, we should not ignore the universe around us. Albert Einstein had a number of famous sayings. One of my favourites is this, quote, keep an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. <laughs> what I've tried to do in this talk is to give a survey of the non-controversial aspects of modern cosmology. There are certainly aspects of modern cosmology that are controversial and for which the data is inconclusive. But essentially everything I've talked about today is independent of vexatious issues such as dark matter, missing mass, dark energy, accelerating cosmological expansion, whether or not there's a cosmological constant and so on. No matter what you think is going on with those specific issues, the ordinary matter, the nuclei, electrons and atoms, is just going to come along for the ride. It's abundantly clear that the universe 14,000 million years ago was a very different place, smaller, hotter, without stars or planets. It's similarly clear that we and the planet around us are made up of heavy elements that are recycled star stuff. We are the end result of nuclear reactions and stellar cores, both thermonuclear fusion and, to some extent, inverse fission. Nuclear reactions built the nuclei of the atoms we are made of. Thermonuclear reactions in the sun continue to provide the entropy gradient that drives our biosphere. These conclusions are based on vast quantities of high-quality data at a level where it would simply be perverse to deny the general picture I have verbally sketched. We are all of us, quite literally, recycled star stuff, and the stars are, quite literally, the crucibles of life and death in the universe around us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Visser. It's uh, a chance for questions for us now, and we would love to know, before you ask your question, who you are. Sir. Hello, I'm Mike Bristow. Um, Dr. Visser, could you explain um, how the universe uh, looks regarding its ex expansion, please? Um, I've heard it's explained like um, we're on the skin of a balloon, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I have a problem with that as far as it appears that there are stars in front of us and behind us mm -hmm. and in every direction. So what's the story there, please? The picture of the expanding universe like a balloon is one standard. One that people don't talk about as much, but almost gets the job done is um, think about a loaf of bread with a lot of raisins in it and a lot of yeast. Okay, As the dough, as the yeast expands the dough, the distance between the raisins certainly gets larger and larger. In fact, the distance between any pair of raisins is going to get larger. And that's pretty much how we should view our galaxies, as the raisins line in a whole bunch of dough that is expanding. Each individual galaxy, like a raisin in a loaf of rising bread, is not changing in size. Uh, each solar system is not changing in size. What is changing, effectively, is the distance between the raisins, the distance between the galaxies. Sir, right at the back. Hi, I'm Eddie Mann. I want to ask, if we could travel out 15 billion light years to the edge of the universe, what would we see? As best we can tell, there is no edge to the universe. Um, there's a difference between... What do we see when we look out 15 billion light years? Because we also see from things from 15 billion years ago. 
And this is different from what would happen if somehow magically we had a warp drive so that right now we could travel out to 15 million year, light years from here. We'd probably see pretty much the same as we see here. So the place where the analogy with the loaf of bread dies down is the loaf of bread, of course, has a finite volume to start with. So we should really be thinking about an infinite loaf of bread in an infinite bakery expanding in all directions. This is where the balloon one is actually a little bit better because with the balloon analogy, the balloon, although it has a finite surface area, doesn't have any edges as such. So if you think of the galaxies as being a number of dots painted on the surface of a balloon and then you blow the balloon up, well, the distance between the galaxies increases the balloon is obviously finite, it has a finite surface area, but it also doesn't have an edge. So as far as we can tell, edge of the universe right now doesn't have much meaning. Edge of the universe, when we look out into space, does have meaning, but it has the meaning that as we look outwards, we're also looking backwards in time, and eventually we look out so far that the galaxies haven't had a chance to form yet, and there's nothing to see. <laughs> okay. And that is what Hubble means when they say in the Hubble Space Telescope that they're seeing the edge of the universe. They're actually seeing out to the very first galaxies that formed and the very first stars that formed. Uh, we can't see directly, but we can certainly infer their existence. Um, so the edge of the universe exists in that sense, but it's a statement of you're looking out so far that nothing has had a chance to form yet. So if you look back far enough then, or out far enough, you would look back to that opaqueness. Exactly, and we do. Then you and that is the longer. cosmic microwave background radiation. And that is what that star map that people come in from the Planck satellites and so on, when you see this cute little star map with all these tiny little ripples on it, that is looking back to the opaqueness. Sir. Hi, uh, Anthony Gladding. Um, just a quick question. You were saying I think it was about 100,000 uh, million years to the end of the universe, effectively. Um, what are we looking at as far as increases in the ambient background temperature of the universe if all that energy goes in? Is it going to raise it a matter of 1, 2, 3 Kelvin? Not even that. It's actually going to decrease it because, yes, the energy smooths out, but the universe is still expanding. And so as the universe expands, the temperature of the cosmic microwave background drop, keeps dropping. So in the heat death, uh, I mean, and it's to some extent a matter of convention once you say there's you know, not enough entropy differences left to drive anything interesting. There was a long paper by uh, Freeman Dyson, a long article where he looked at the question of how long could an arbitrarily advanced civilization conceivably keep some sort of uh, ecology going in an expanding universe. And that's roughly where I got those sorts of numbers from. Uh, but the answer is that eventually the temperature will drop down to as close to absolute zero as you might want to think, because it's the expansion of the universe that keeps driving it. As long as the universe keeps expanding. Okay, there are people who speculate about the possibility that the expansion could stop turn around and we could enter a contracting phase. Uh, that is not really uh, supported by the current evidence, but it's certainly something that some people uh, like to speculate about. In a universe like that, you don't have a heat death, you have a big crunch, which is the opposite for a big bang, uh, which in many ways is worse. <laughs> <laughs> Just one more question. Yes. Uh, hello, I'm Michael Hurst. I, um, I'm still back with the infinite loaf. Um, and I, I want to know the original quark gluon soup, mm -hmm. therefore, theoretically, must have been infinite itself. Isn't that the case? Or was there always an infinite amount of material? Um, and the second mm -hmm. part of my question is, can we locate where that original quark gluon soup was? Um, first, whether or not it was infinite 
depends critically on whether you think that the universe has positive, negative, or zero space curvature. And our observations right now really cannot tell us that, and we have good suspicion, to, good reason to believe we're right on the borderline between positive and negative space curvature. So probably it was infinite volume, and it was always infinite volume in space, probably. As for where, the answer actually is everywhere, since it was the entire space that expanded. The Big Bang was not an explosion in space. It was an explosion of space. And you cannot use a lot of the intuition that you develop by thinking about points in space. You really have to think about space itself as growing everywhere and always. Thank you again, Dr. Visser. I'm going to hold on to the Eagle Nebula as being like a bicycle pump that's just hundreds of millions of miles across. That's, that's worthy of Douglas Adams, I think. I want to take the opportunity before we go of uh, warmly inviting on-air listeners to attend the other lectures in this series. Uh, for the following six weeks, we are possibly going to be near your own home. We will be having lectures in Palmerston North, in New Plymouth, Timaru, Whangarei, Nelson, and finally in Wellington. But this coming week, we look forward to your company in Palmerston North. On Wednesday evening at the Spears Centre at Palmerston North Boys High, Dr Robert Hanna from Otago University is giving a lecture on the element of time as it has been measured through the ages. And for more details on that lecture, you can email for an automated response to einstein at radioNZ.co.nz. And no, unfortunately, he does not work for us. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Visser. Ladies and gentlemen, good night. <laughs>